Welcome to a new Carter Report series, The Game Changers. These rare individuals appear once in a lifetime. Like a blazing meteor across the night sky, they change the course of history. They show us the way forward. Welcome to The Game Changers. I'm so glad that you're here today. This is The Lady Game Changers Continued. We're going to talk about those remarkable women who changed the course of history. Now, none of these ladies were really political or powerful. I had in my original notes that they weren't wealthy. Well, some of them were. <laughs> but they weren't well-connected. During a time when women were treated shame as second-class citizens, they outshone most of the men. We're going to discover today that when the men ran to the hills, they ran to the cross. Amazing. During the time when Christ lived, the word of a woman didn't count. That's why the disciples, when they heard the reports of the women, they said, it's nonsense, it's foolishness. But Jesus changed all that because he was the great liberator. The first lady game changer in today's presentation is Mary, the peasant girl who became the mother of Christ, the greatest person in the history of the world. And I want you to take your Bibles and come with me to Matthew chapter 1 and verses 18 to 24. We're going to turn to the New Testament to Matthew chapter 1 and verses 18 and onwards, 18 to 24. You got it? It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, uh, don't be afraid to take you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of uh, the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by, by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife, but did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now this Mary, I'm told in Scripture, had no wealth and no earthly power and no political influence. I've seen pictures in recent times like you have of refugees at the border. You've seen pictures of poor, young, oppressed peasant girls. Mary was a bit like that. Did you know that Mary and her son, Jesus, were refugees. Mary didn't belong to a British royal family. Uh, she didn't look anything like Princess Kate. Now, I think Princess Kate is very beautiful. <laughs> uh, in a chariot, and not a chariot, but in a, in a carriage. I've seen her in this golden carriage and you say, my, isn't she just absolutely beautiful? 
but Mary didn't look like Princess Kate. Mary wasn't European. Did you know this? Mary was not a European, like I am, with fair skin and blue eyes. <laughs> Mary was a Semite. She belonged to a minority group. Mary was a Jew. More closely related to the Arabs racially than to me. You say, no, this can't be true. Jesus was obviously um, something like a European. No, he was a Semite. The great angel Gabriel visited her with some astounding news. She would become pregnant without a man's help and she'd bear a son and he would be the Jewish Messiah. Amazing. Luke chapter 1, 34 and 35 says, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be? Since I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, the skeptic says it's absolutely impossible, this idea of the virgin birth. But I want to say to everybody today that the great God who made the stars and the whole of the universe can do a few things that you and I cannot understand. And so God said, I'm going to do it. And she didn't question and she didn't doubt the word of the Lord. Look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 38. Luke 1 verse 38. Then Mary said, Behold, the manservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She didn't have a lot of money. You know what she had? She had a lot of faith. And she had a lot of faith and the great God who made the stars. She was given, my friends, the greatest honor. The greatest honor is not to be the president of the United States because you may be here today and gone tomorrow. Or the king or the queen of Great Britain. That's not the greatest honor. Now, I was brought up to believe in royalty. I was brought up to believe in marching soldiers and their big hats and... uh, really swinging their arms. I was brought up to believe in marching bands and all of that stuff. But Mary wasn't. Mary was a peasant girl, but she was not an ignorant girl. Mary was a, an educated girl because she knew the scriptures. She breaks forth into a hymn of praise, Luke 1, 46 to 49. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maid servant. Just, just think of this. How beautiful. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. She was poor, but she was not uneducated. She had a marvelous grasp of scripture. Her baby was born in a barn in a little town by the name of Bethlehem. In a shed behind a very, very cheap motel. And they couldn't get into the motel. I want the women here to think of this this young peasant girl. She's having a baby, no doctors, no nurses. What were all the priests doing? What were all the great religious leaders doing? Totally oblivious to the greatest event in the history of the world. What does that tell you? And when she takes this little baby in her arms, maybe nine pounds, and she kisses this baby. She kisses the face of Almighty God. 
Can you believe it? She brings him up and she has him for 30 years. The Bible tells us she had other sons and daughters. Mark chapter 6 and verse 3 says, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Joses, Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. So he had brothers and sisters. Were these the children of Joseph by another marriage? We are not told in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5 says, Do we have no right to take along a believing wife as to also the, uh, the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? And so Jesus had brothers and sisters. Did Mary have grandchildren? Probably. Was she a perpetual virgin as is taught by the great Roman Catholic Church? And that is why they call her still the Blessed Virgin Mary? Is this taught in the Bible? No, it's not. If you look at Matthew 1 and verse 24 and 25, it says, Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her relationships with her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. Was she sinless? The Roman Catholic doctrine of the Immaculate Conception says that immediately after her conception she was made free of all hereditary defilement. Thus, she was totally sinless. Is this taught in the Bible? No, it is contradicted by every text in the Bible. Mary was a sinner, saved by grace, and Jesus was a saviour. We don't pray to Mary because Mary can't save us. We follow the Bible. We don't follow the church. When Jesus was crucified and the men ran for the hills, Mary is there at the cross. Jesus mentions her in his dying breath to John. John was there. Jesus loved his mother and she loved him. She is there at Pentecost when the Spirit is poured out. Then nothing else in Scripture History is silent. The Pope says that she was assumed into heaven. This is called the doctrine of the assumption. But it is a pious myth, not taught in the Bible. It is just another man-made tradition. Mary is sleeping with the rest of the saints awaiting the resurrection. But one day I tell you, on the authority of the word of God, Mary will be with her son in glory. Mary had the greatest honor that was ever given to a human being. Our second great lady is another Mary. And she is a bit of a mystery woman. And this part of my talk may have just a little bit of controversy and I'm glad about that. Mary Magdalene was the woman possessed by seven demons who became Christ's friend and disciple. Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. We read about this lady, Luke chapter 8, the woman with a past. Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, she came from a town by the name of Magdala, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, 
and many others who provided for him from their sustenance. But every time the women are mentioned, it is invariably Mary Magdalene. Note this well. It's quite extraordinary. Mary Magdalene is mentioned 12 times in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, more than most of the apostles. She had hit bottom. Her life was a disaster. Now, this is the scenario. It says Jesus cast seven demons out of her. But Jesus on one other occasion spoke about a person uh, who had one demon and the demon was cast out and Jesus said when the house was vacant and empty, seven other demons came back in. This may have happened to Mary. She may have had a demon cast out by the Lord, but she lapsed back into sin. And seven demons came into her. She was much worse off. She was probably afflicted with physical and nervous, maybe even mental problems because of the demonism. Hers was a hopeless case. We would say today, many years ago, Dr. John Hammond and I were summoned to go to a home in Australia in a little town by the name of Woi Woi. This lady was coming to my meetings. And one night she stayed behind after the meeting, meeting and she said, I, I have a terrible problem. I need for you to come. I said, what, what is it? She said, uh, every time I get into bed at night, a demon gets in with me. Dr. Hammond and I will come. When we walked through the front door of this home in Australia, our hair stood up. We felt we were in the presence uh, of demons. She told me uh, that the, the curtain, she said, look at the curtain rods at nighttime. And she had all these beautiful little children. They were sitting in one part of the living room and they were sitting there terrified. She said, the curtain rods come out and they flow around the room and they chase us. She told me how she'd turned away from Christ. She'd been a believer and she turned away from Christ and she went along to seances. If you go along to a seance, you are putting your soul in the hands of the devil. And the devil had possessed her. And when we knelt down to pray for her, she would go into a trance. And Dr. Hammond and I spent much of the night there praying for her that the spirits would leave her and we could feel their presence. So don't scoff about demon possession because it happens. Then Mary Magdalene met Jesus and her life was totally changed. She lived at least for a while in the fishing village of Magdala a fishing town that was rich and corrupt, not far, notice this, not far from Bethany. Now there's some controversy concerning the Marys of the New Testament. Every Bible scholar will tell you this. Now some believe, including me, that she's the woman of Luke chapter 7, verse 36 and onwards. Please turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 and verse 36 and onwards. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house, sat down uh, to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, it means a prostitute. And she knew that Jesus sat on the table in the Pharisee's house bought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them uh, with fragrant oil. 
Then he turned to the woman because she's terribly criticized by the Pharisee, the righteous person. He turned to the woman, said to Simon, the Pharisee, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head. Pharisee wouldn't do this. He was too righteous, too good. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with tears and with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. So here is a woman who comes into the house of Simon the Pharisee. It is the town of Bethany, and she comes with a flask of extremely expensive oil. Now, some believe that Christ cast out the demons from this woman, and she showed her gratitude and joined his team as recorded a few verses down the road in Luke chapter 8. Listen carefully because I'm going to have folks write to me on this. The story of a woman anointing Jesus with expensive perfume is recorded four times in the Gospels. And I have put up the four references. Luke 7, we've read it. You can take notes. Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John chapter 12. And they all have uh, remarkable similarities. But they vary a little bit because the Bible is written few, uh, through the eyes of different personalities. And so the anointing is mentioned four times. Many similarities. Happens in Bethany, in the home of Simon, this pharisaical humbug, and the perfume is very expensive. It happens in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and Simon the Pharisee. Now look at John chapter 12 and verse 3. John chapter 12 and verse 3. Now this is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. That Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. I think this is the same story. And anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Now listen, I'm going to tell you some amazing things. In one of the Gospels, we may read it today, we have time. The people with hard hearts say this could have been sold uh, for a large sum of money and the money given to the poor. They said this perfume was worth 300 denarii, which is more than a year's wages. So let's bring it into our own society here in America. Let's say... This is a stab in the dark, but let's say the average salary in America for an individual is $50,000. Then this perfume, ounce for ounce, is worth about three times as much as gold is. You can't say it's worth its weight in gold. No, gold, say, $1,500 an ounce. But about 12 ounces of this stuff works at about $4,000 an ounce. You can understand why the Pharisee, Simon, and Judas were hopping mad. What an extravagance. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Now this stuff, would you know, like to know where it comes from? It comes from the Himalayas in India. The foothills of the Himalayas up about ten or 12,000 feet. It is made out of the spike of this 
plant. It is called spikenard. And she poured more than a year's wages. Some believe that Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and Martha is the same lady as Mary of Magdala. Here's the scenario. She lives in Bethany, but she leaves home. She's a young person who's gone wild, sick to death of organized religion. She went to a fishing town. She became a a prostitute. She became filled with demons. And she found Jesus. Or more accurately, Jesus found her. And then she returns to Bethany. Now, much, much more about the lady game changers and Mary, the next pro- the ex prostitute, in just a few moments. The word began in a village. Churches and schools sprang up and multiplied reaching into the city. Great truths revealed to the people of Papua New Guinea, changing thousands of lives. Our eyes are going to be opened to the discovery of amazing truths. The greatest truth in the Bible, it is the truth that God loves you. It has completely changed my life and I'm going to be baptized this Sabbath. Pastor Kara has put something in my heart that I will never forget. Thank you, Pastor Kata, for your program. It has changed my life completely. John Carter's Great Truths Revealed was recorded live from Papua New Guinea. Experience the miracles in this 21 DVD series for a gift of $150 US or $210 Australian. To order, visit our website or call. 1.3 billion people live in India. Two hundred million of these are Dalits. Dalits, formerly called untouchables, are the lowest members of the caste system. One hundred percent of your gift will go to fund projects for Dalit girls as an alternative to slavery and prostitution. Your gift of six hundred dollars will educate, clothe, and feed one Dalit girl between five and fifteen years of age for one year. Go to carterreport.org or to the address on the screen to send your gift of $600 and change the life of one Indian Dalit girl for one full year. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, Contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.